Good morning folks, this is the Daniel Code Report for the 4th of October. My name is John Needham, I'll be your host for the day. Well, we've had a very momentous week, markets have just been doing yo-yo tricks up and down, huge ranges, massive volatility. Uh, during the week the VIX got to uh, 50, uh, pretty well unseen, unheard of sort of numbers. And uh, there's been a battle basically in the equity markets between those who believed or hoped fervently that the bailout package was going to be of great benefit and those uh, like me who believed that it was really just uh, a morale booster uh, but more focused on legitimising the steps that uh, the Treasury has been taking and feels it will need to take in the future. I wrote an article about this uh, day before yesterday, it's available at the Daniel Code website at www.thedanielcode.com if you prefer to read it. Uh, but I will go through those points with you now and then uh, uh, later on in uh, our talk today we'll look at uh, the gold, silver markets, bonds and equities, uh, see how they reacted to the week's shenanigans. The time rapidly drove near that it was uh, revealed to us the second coming of Paulson's Bill of Fiscal Resurrection for the Chosen on Wall Street and as I said in the article we're required strangely in the words of the Church of England wedding rites possibly the least adhered to imprecation in human history to compose our minds to consider that which is to come. Dearly beloved we are gathered together here in the face of this congregation actually Congress to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony which is an honourable estate instituted of God in the time of man's innocence and therefore is not by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand unadvisedly, lightly or wantonly, but reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly and in the fear of God. The bellows of self-interest from Wall Street for Paulson's bailout plan have been deafening. Faced with an equal cacophony from Main Street, our leaders are striving to present the current banking crisis as an American problem in an endeavour to blunt constituents' anger at the fat cat's reprieve when Main Street really wants them skinned. Many have advanced alternate plans with varying degrees of usefulness as they range from impractical to impossible. What we had on the table for Friday is a prenuptial agreement. It allocates all the goodies to Paulson and Co and gives vague language on oversight, transparency and clawback to the helpless bride that you guys and a shotgun wedding. There is zero evidence of discreetly, advisedly or soberly, but indeed the whole process has been undertaken unadvisedly and wantonly. The only innocence apparent is in the hapless taxpayers who knowing little will bear this burden and the others to come. Unfortunately, the banking crisis is now a global banking crisis as UK, European and Asian banks too have been polluted with the global asset securitisation bomb. With emotions running high and everybody talking their trade, it behoves us to step back a pace and review what is real and what is spin. Regardless of whether the bailout bill is passed today as it is, or was never to be passed, it really makes no difference. The facts remain the same and they are being massaged to substantiate whatever agenda is being pushed by a worldwide range of incumbents. And make no, no mistake, this is now a worldwide problem and potential solutions, even if they're mistaken, are of great interest to the international community. For this debate there were basically three propositions advanced, which stripped of the spin can be summarised as follows. Paulson's Proposition A argued, give me the money and trust me to do what has to be done, even though I don't know what that is yet. Congressional leaders lined up behind him saying the price tag of the bill may be unpalatable, but it's necessary to keep credit flowing for student loans, car loans and home mortgages. You see their attempt to broaden the debate to include Main Street. Boner said it's necessary to avert the crisis in the nation's financial markets. If we don't pass this bill, serious harm will occur, agreed House Financial Services Committee Chairman Barney Frank. The legislation got a tentative thumbs up from both presidential candidates. Uh, McCain said um, something, this is something that all of us will swallow hard and go forward with. Obama's comment, my inclination would be to vote for it, 
with the understanding that I'm not happy with it. Backers of the bill said it will help ordinary Americans as well as teetering investment houses. This isn't about a bailout of Wall Street, said Nancy Pelosi. It's a buy-in so we can turn our economy around. The opponent's proposition, let's call it Proposition B, Democratic member of the House Financial Services Committee, Brad Sherman of California, accused the Bush administration of creating an exaggerated panic about the possibility of the stock market collapsing. Basically, they gave Congress a ransom note. We've got your 401k, and if you want to see your 401k alive, give us $700 billion in unmarked bills, Sherman said. Proposition C is the banker's alternative, and what the banks are lacking is capital. Basically, they're saying, give us direct injections of capital rather than fixing the impaired assets. But there's a PS. You need to fix up the assets as well. Irretrievable breakdown of marriage. The grounds for this breakdown is that the banks, including the largely now defunct shadow banks, have losses of about one and a half trillion to face up to from their ruinous affair with this saucy securitization chip. The foibles of complete ignorance coupled with the exuberance of greed leading to the application of vastly excessive leverage has devastated all who flirted with this fam. Like all philandering husbands, the banks tried to the end to keep their nocturnal activities shielded from public gaze, and hence much of the off-field drama happened in sieves, conduits and other off-balance sheet vehicles. With no central register of these securities and completely misleading balance sheets, how was an erstwhile suitor to make a reasonable assessment of the transgressor's worth? Many tried. Sovereign wealth funds and hedge funds were the first to jump into the fray to provide additional injections of capital in the mistaken belief that the party had only been temporarily adjourned and they could be the first guests into the new venue. They were properly rewarded for their lust when those unselfish but foolish early contributions were destroyed by subsequent insolvency. In their trip towards acknowledging the extent of their losses, banks have admitted to about $600 billion in losses, which has comprehensively destroyed almost that much in capital. Having seen what fate beheld for early adopters, those suitors who still had some lead in their pencils are being extremely cautious. Nobody wants to do a deal without Grandma Fed giving some guarantees of virginity or at least a modicum of decorum. Banks quite rightly don't want to lend to each other because they now know that the balance sheets are palpably false and they can no longer, if they ever could, assess counterparty veracity. Let's fake it. You don't need a degree in economics to understand why credit markets are locked. Banks who have been trading on their counterparty's reputational risk have been burned as it has become apparent that many reputations were more hot air and corporate posturing uh, than they were real assets. We all know now that the lack of oversight, all the way from the risk managers to the auditors to the CEOs, regulators and the ultimate overseers, the Fed and the Treasury, have been at best negligent and at worst clueless. That's why the counterparty risk has continually fallen over. That's why AIG and the companies that have written the big counterparty risk could not be exposed to the light of day. The reality is they can't settle. AIG needed an $85 billion bailout just to keep going and meet its expenses. They've underwritten something of the order of $385 billion of counterparty debt. And the real truth is they don't have it. It's that simple. With the best will in the world, the off-balance sheet sieves, conduits and unregulated derivatives have made a proper assessment of counterparty risk impossible. Now to add insult to injury, Treasury has approved the SEC changing the rules on impaired asset valuation. Under the new ages, if you don't like the numbers which the market gives you on asset valuation, you can adopt one of several alternatives, all of which allow subjective assumptions. In other words, just fake it. So we're now deteriorating from the pretend mark to market, we went to the mark to myth, to the mark to market, to I'm not going to do it, to I won't tell you, and now they've reached the ultimate fantasy, make it up as you go along.